Trustees, we received apologies from Councillor Dennis Allen, both you and Councillor McNeil, and also apologies from Janet Hanson and your many of the Gross, who is not competent to place of Janet. Okay, mm -hmm. on the preliminary matters, is there any declarations of interest of any members passing on the agenda? Peter? Yeah, Chair, can I declare an interest in all procurements have stayed in item number nine, and the five fits all, being a member of I'm interested in uh, item five as I'm a member of St John. Members, the purpose of this report is to request that you consider the historic analysis of fatalities occurring in accidental dwelling fires over what is a nine year period from 2006 7 through to 2015 16. Uh, the report of which is set out in Appendix A of this covering report, that's pages 57 through to 78. A summary of the analysis is provided in the paragraph 6 to 20, which is on pages 50. I'll just summarise for you now. 
Over the period, there was a total of 84 fatalities resulting from 18 incidents, which is an average of just over nine fatalities each year. Just to explain that, then, what that means is there was a number of incidents where there was more than one fatality occurred in that in, in, in the incident. Wills suffered the greatest number of fire deaths in actual terms and when expressed against the uh, head of population. Liverpool suffered the next greatest number against both of those measures. 79 of the 84 fatalities were white British, that equates to 94%. There's an almost equal distribution between male and female fatalities, which was 44 to 40. So 44 male, 40 female fatalities. The 40 to 49 and 75 and above age groups suffered the highest number of fatalities, with deaths in the younger age bracket being highest in deprived areas, and deaths in the older age brackets being high, uh, high in more affluent areas. 47 of the 80 incidents of smoke alarm was fitted and actuated. In six incidents, a smoke alarm was fitted but did not actuate, and there were reasons for that which are largely down to the position of the smoke alarm relative to the, the room of origin and the fact that there will have been insufficient smoke to actuate the alarm or in the event of a heat detector where there's been insufficient heat to operate. In six of the incidents, it wasn't possible for us to determine whether the smoke alarm had actuated or not. In five of the incidents, a smoke alarm was fitted, but it was inoperable, for example, through having the batteries removed or it having been uh, disconnected from the mains or, the, or some other physical intervention to prevent it from working. In 16 of the incidents, there wasn't a smoke alarm. On 48 occasions, the victim had received a home fire safety check, compared to 28 occasions where no home fire safety check had been undertaken that we could directly attribute to the victim involved. Of the remaining six incidents, we were unable to establish if the victim was the occupier of the property at the time of the home fire safety check, and that's based on the currency of the records and the revisit profile. 42 of the incidents, smokers' materials were determined as being responsible for the cause. If we were to analyse the room of origin and the ignition source and taking those two things together, smokers' materials were responsible for the majority of the fire fatalities when the room of origin was either the living room or the bedroom. When you factor in the influence of alcohol consumption, it's apparent that a high number of deaths involving smokers' materials in the bedroom have involved the consumption of alcohol as well. Concerning fires that started in the living room, however, that same principle doesn't apply. The highest number of deaths occurred between November and February, although a high number of deaths were also recorded in the month of April. Deaths have been most likely to occur over the period on Mondays and Fridays. Contrary to popular belief, the majority of fatalities occur during the daytime rather than overnight, with 43 of the 80 incidents, or 64%, occurring between 0700 hours and 2200 hours. Members should be reassured that we use this information to ensure that our our interventions, our community safety interventions are most appropriately targeted in order to reduce risk. And the same is also true of how we shape our operational response capability. But to be very clear about one point, just because more fatalities have occurred during the daytime than overnight, it is of absolute importance that we maintain the fastest response times possible throughout the 24 hour period. Because the fact still remains these incidents occur at all times of the day. So we need to be fast all of the time when these incidents occur. And that's a point that I'm going to return to when I speak to the IRMP 
uh, draft that RMP for 2017-20, which is on the agenda uh, a little further on. Pause at that point, Chair, and take any questions.
the uh, I, I concur with the assessment of uh, of Councillor Roberts. That's clear. It's a fact. You can see that we've made that point. Uh, I think we're lobbying it, which, as you are all aware, is something that we've, uh, that we've sought to, uh, to to be again relentless with. Uh, the only other comment that I would make is that these figures are not unique to Merseyside. These figures are reflected across the uh, certainly across England. information um, getting shared adequately because I've sat at Wirral on the health and wellbeing boards and everybody's talking about sharing information and a lot of it does get shared and I think Wirral was one of the first areas where adult social care started to share um, with ourselves with the fire service so those people who were deemed as perhaps more vulnerable than others but uh, I have to say I've come away from all of those meetings um, with a heavy heart really because as we're always hoping to get there and they're talking about you know by 2020 we'll have everybody talking with the same data and everything but in the meantime not just for older people and fires but for all services there's people getting lost and losing their lives really and I'm, I'm just wondering you know how deeply the fire service can um, go into that issue really and try to push um, the various um, other partners, departments, and um, because clearly, you know, we can't go on with, you know, and, and I agree, you know, um, we are limited with our, with our finance, but we can't go on um, with resources being being cut from us, and also the data not being completely exact. One thing just doesn't appear comfortably at all with the other. So, can I just ask what we do specifically in relation to? So we have uh, agreements, uh, national agreements in place, which Merseyside has not. They relate to what's termed Exeter data, so obviously the farms data from the, the NHS, which, uh, which, which, which is shared with us. We have a, uh, without getting into too much technical detail, but our, we have a database where that information is captured, captured securely. So all of our operational crews, the home fire safety checks that they undertake are all drawn. We are targeting the, the bulk of our, our volume intervention, which is through our, our fire crews, is at the 65s. So when we uh, when we are making our interventions, they are at the most high risk group. Councillor Rennie is absolutely correct in that as people are living longer, clearly the elderly population therefore is, and some of the population increases that we've seen across Merseyside is because people. through an increase in the elderly population. The fact remains in with issues particularly in relation to dementia, uh, dementia rather, the, 
there is a limit to what the fire and rescue service is able to do there. You know, we will we will intervene in, in that we will fit through smoke alarms, we will get fire safety advice, we will refer on to our advocacy teams, but our advocates can only do so much. We are then largely at the behest of other agencies whose demand is increasing exponentially. And I guess the bottom line here is ultimately we cannot be standing over people 24 hours a day, which actually in some circumstances is what would be required. Because even with things like domestic sprinklers, we are still seeing fatalities occurring even with that extent of intervention from the fire and rescue service, <coughs> simply because the individual's lifestyle is such that they invariably have it, whether it be a fire or some other event, To reassure members, you know, we are doing all we can do, but with a finite resource, and that is a point that I will return to on the, uh, when speaking to the IRMP, you must understand that there is a limit to that which we can do.
slightly more uplifting report this time for you members. The purpose of this report is to inform members of the outcomes of the staff engagement survey which was held between the 1st of June to 4th of July and to request that members give their support to the engagement action plan which has been developed in response to the priority areas which were identified from within the, the survey. Members may recall that we undertook our first employee engagement survey for a number of years back in 2014. The survey undertaken this year used the same question set as that as we used in 2014, which enabled an accurate benchmark of our progress to be determined. The survey was undertaken by People Insight and was completely independent of the service, which is important because that enables the authority to maintain the, confidenti uh, the confidentiality and anonymity for all of the staff who are completing the survey. Paragraph 7 to 10 on pages, uh, so page 80 rather, set out the organisational context. It's fair to say, members, that this survey and indeed the last survey have been undertaken at a time of unprecedented change and uncertainty for our staff. That is probably an understatement. That's a thought that I'd, I'd ask you to hold because I'll return to that point uh, a little further on when we speak to this report. The survey methodology set out at paragraphs 11 and 12, which are pages 80 to 81. I'm aware that the outcomes of the survey have already been presented to you, members, at your <coughs> event on the 6th of September, as indeed we have to the strategic management group back in August and the rep bodies. So I don't propose to revisit the outcomes here in any great detail, given the, the depth of some of the other issues which are on the agenda today. A concise summary is provided within the report of paragraphs 15 to 26, which is on pages 81 through to 84. But it would be remiss of me not to state that the 19% improvement in engagement is one of the highest that's ever been observed by people. Our next steps are set out in paragraphs 27 through 31, which is on pages 85 through to 86. I would like to conclude, members, by drawing your attention to the comments made by the FBU as set out in paragraph 13 on page 81. Now, I won't read that out because you can all see that for yourselves, but what I would say is that I absolutely share the optimism as expressed by the FBU. For us to achieve an outcome as we have in such challenging circumstances is testament to the commitment, to effort and hard work from all of our staff and their representatives and we should be rightly proud of that achievement. I'll pause at that point to take any questions that members might have. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Chair. Well, I very much welcome the report and I totally accept that the overall results are very positive and do indicate that we've come a long way in the last two years. But I have to admit to being even slightly disappointed, even where we've made great strides over the last couple of years. Uh, and just a couple of examples, Chair. At the bottom of page 82, uh, where it says, I care about the future of MFRA, 88%. Now, on the face of it, 88% is a very high figure and does look commendable. But are we really saying that more than one in ten of the staff don't care about the future of the MFRA? I mean, that to me is, is still a bit disappointing. And just one other uh, example, Chair. I'm not trying to be negative, because as I say, I do very much welcome the report, which is, which is very positive. But again, near the, uh, the bottom of the same page, where it says, I do not feel I've been bullied, harassed or discriminated against in the last 12 months. Now, it's gone up 27% in the last two years. But it's still 75%. So, again, are we saying that one in four of the staff do actually feel that they are being bullied, harassed, or discriminated against? So, even though we've come a long way in the last two years and are very much welcome that, I would still like to see you know, improvements in some areas like that. Because I would like to think that everybody employed by MFRA cares about the future of MFRA. And I would like to think that we can get to the stage where nobody feels that they're being bullied, discriminated. Just, just to respond to you, Councillor Kelly, then fully accept the uh, that, that I think they're reasonable, Councillor Agent, because that's 
I too, I mean, that, that's very much the way I would view that clearly because it, it is ultimately when you, you lead an organisation clearly inspired by 100% of people to, to certainly to be committed to MFA. I think you could even say applies to the point around the uh, around fear of bullies and ask the discriminated against. What I would say is that much, much of this is down to how the individual perceives the question. So, in relation to the uh, being bullied and asked or discriminated, there is, there is many of our staff who feel under significant pressure, actually not because anything that anybody is doing to them within this organisation, but because of what's being done to them more broadly around the extent of the, the austerity and the financial challenges. So again, there's a context there which doesn't always, I'm not saying that's necessarily no, the no. case on any occasion, but it's just worth paying that point in mind. And equally, I don't care about the future of, of, of MFRA. Now, I, I cannot believe that that isn't 100%, but again, it may just be the way that the individual has viewed, if you like, that particular question. Because it, it may be that they identify more, let's say, if it's a, if it's a watch-based individual, and you said, do you care about your watch? And it would be absolutely. Do you care about MFRA? But they don't really identify necessarily in the same way. Well, nonetheless, the points that you make are entirely valid and, and absolutely are taken on board. And hopefully what comes through within the within the report, indeed in the next step, is you can see what our commitment is to future engagement because you know, we, we again will be relentless. And I make no apologies for using that word as, as often as I have because it does Thank you.